Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I am so very glad you're here. Uh, my name is Seth. This is the Foundry, where we're all about a better you and a better world. I don't know if you noticed, but we have a stage extension. So I feel like we're a lot closer. Are you guys okay with it? Like, are you uncomfortable? Like, get out of my face? Like, I feel like I can touch the camera guy. Adam's just sitting there. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Um, I'm so very glad you're here. Today we begin a brand new series. Oh, there's a play coming that the school that's here is going to do. So the, chain, the stage will change in like a couple weeks. There'll be like a whole setting thing. It'll be cool. Um, we don't really do anything with it, but it's, it's cool. It's awesome. So anyways, so we begin our new series, our Christmas series, that we're calling Wake Up, O Sleeper. Uh, and I'm excited for this series because we're going to be approaching like the thoughts, the ideas, the reality of Christmas from a bit of a different angle. But I believe it's going to be a bit of a different angle that will serve to open us up, to, 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 to tune us into some pretty important and powerful thoughts and ideas that are not limited to, limited to just this time of year, but like are important for like how we frame the rest of our lives. Here's what I mean. Each year we celebrate the birth of Jesus, right? Yeah, obviously, that's the Christmas, that's what we do. Christmas is a time where we get to celebrate the, that Jesus, the Messiah, has been born unto us this day in a manger in a town called Bethlehem. That's awesome, that's exciting, that's a good thing. God has gifted God's self to humanity in the form of a human that we might have salvation, that there might be redemption for all of mankind and all of creation, that's exciting. There's all kinds of significance that the birth of the Messiah would have had for the people of the time in the Bible, like when this thing would have first happened. There's all kinds of significance as to like, what the birth of the Messiah means to us today. But if I, can, if I could like, have a little moment of, a, of, of like confessional, my, my confession in all of this celebration is like, uh, sometimes it feels like we're just phoning it in. You know what I'm saying? Like, th this, is my, this will be my 11th Christmas series that I've preached on. 11 times I've gone through four weeks of preaching about the birth of Jesus. And we've come at this from all different angles. We've tried traditional angles. Uh, last year, we did like the Celtic Christmas, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, a couple years ago, we did Christmas in like outer space, which was weird, but kind of interesting and cool. Uh, we did the, the various women of Christmas. If you remember going through the genealogy of Jesus, looking at the women there, that was cool. We've done like how each gospel introduced Jesus. Like that was pretty cool. All these things are like pretty exciting. They're pretty neat. But it seems like no matter what angle we take on this thing, uh, it feels like at this time of the year, not much has changed in how we actually live. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, not, not much has changed. We, we do the same things. We, we, maybe we go to church a few extra times a year. We show up. We hope the preacher has, like, a, 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 some new way to make this old, familiar story exciting. And then even if he does, like, we already know the story. We've heard it. You know, and if you've grown up in church, you've heard it for 30 or 50 or 60 or 70 years of your life. And, like... It's not really surprising. I mean, it's like Easter, right? Like, you don't get caught off guard by Good Friday. Like, what's going to happen? No, you know. We, we know what's going to happen. We, we've, we, it's already happened. We're, we, we, we know what to expect. And so over, like, my decade of Christmas series, what I've noticed is that it seems like we're just kind of doing the same thing again. Like, we still overbook our schedules. We still overspin on presents and food or whatever. We still get stressed out and dealing with our family because, like, why did she make that comment when she opened the present I got her anyways? Do you know? <laughs> and if we're not careful, we end up draining all of our resources this time of year. Like, we drain our, 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 our finances. We drain our, our, our time. We drain our emotional stability. And then we get into January, and we're like, man, I'm glad Christmas is over. <laughs> Whew, that was a lot. Like, I, I've never heard, and this could just be me, I've never heard somebody go, man, <laughs> Christmas was so refreshing this year. I'm, like, so filled up. <laughs> like, I don't even know what to do with myself. Like, I'm just refreshed, and life is... 
I, I've never heard somebody go, man, you know what? Like, I think Christmas is so important to me that this year I'm actually going to like do some things differently. I'm actually going to slow down. I think I'm going to spin less. I'm going to radically shift my focus this year. Like, so I'm super grateful that Jesus came. Obviously, I think if you're here, you are, but like what has changed in how we actually live this time of year? So Advent, which is what this time of the year is called according to the church calendar, Advent means the coming or it means the arrival of something. So something is coming, which kind of implies that there is this like period of waiting, which uh, to me makes sense like originally. That, That makes sense because like before Jesus shows up, the people are waiting for the Messiah. They're waiting for the Savior to show up to rescue them. They're waiting for somebody to deliver them. But for us who are living like a couple thousand years later, who believe the Messiah has already come, we celebrate Christmas by what? By, by pretending like we're waiting? Isn't that kind of weird? Like we're pretending like we're waiting, even though we know that the thing we're actually waiting for has already come. So um, it makes me wonder like maybe that's, maybe that's why like we, we like Christmas and we like Christmas a lot, but Is it possible that we've allowed our love of the tradition of Christmas to actually overshadow the profound significance of the incarnation in our lives? Which which might be why like we get to this time of year and not much seems to have changed with how we operate. So so maybe maybe um like if, if God has already come, what is it that we're waiting for? If the God of the universe has already taken on flesh and blood and walked among us and rescued and redeemed all things, then we're not really waiting, are we? So maybe we need a, a, a different perspective. Maybe we need to uh, come at this thing from a, from a different angle. If the thing we're waiting for has already arrived, then maybe it's not humanity that's doing the waiting. Maybe it's, maybe it's God who's actually waiting. Maybe God is waiting for us to wake up to that which is already present in our reality. Maybe God is the one waiting for humanity to wake up to God's incarnate presence that has already arrived. So in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says this. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So Paul is writing to the early believers at the church in Ephesus, but unlike some of his other letters, when he's writing this, he's not, he's not addressing a problem. He's not responding to a question. He's not addressing any sort of false teaching. He's writing to help expand the church's understanding of God's eternal purpose in the role of the church. So this verse 14 in chapter five is actually part of a much larger section where Paul is giving instructions for what Christian living looks like. It actually starts back in chapter four. And and he starts by saying, don't live like the Gentiles do. He says they've hardened their hearts. They've lost their sensitivity to the thing of God. Don't don't do those sorts of things. And then then he, he like lists for them all these different instructions. Here's what you should do. Here's what you should do. Here's what you should do. And then throughout it, throughout this book, what you see is like, He uses this various language where there is like uh, life and death. He uses light and darkness. And then when you get into verse 14, he says, wake up, sleeper, sleeping and being awake. So throughout this book and stuff, what you see is these three different images. and, And these three different images all, they invoke this movement, Right? They invoke movement. They invoke this forward progress from darkness into light, from death into life, from being asleep to being awake. It's like Paul is kind of saying to the people, like, hey, 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 snap out of it. You've become numb to the way that you're living. You're just kind of going along with culture. You're, you've been lulled to sleep, and now it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up to this higher calling, this greater purpose, this deeper and more meaningful way to live. 
Right? And so this isn't the only place that Paul uses this language and this expression and these ideas. You have Ephesians chapter 5. You have uh, Romans chapter 13, which says this. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when, it, than when we first believed. He says something similar in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the, to the darkness. So then let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. So there's this continual idea that we've fallen asleep. We've fallen asleep and need to wake up. Wake up to the thing that is in front of us. Wake up to the new thing, the better thing, the right thing, the true thing. This ultimate reality that is the presence of God that is in and through all things. So again, Maybe the waiting of Advent, because Jesus has already come, is not us waiting on God, but God waiting on us. Because here's the thing, even before Jesus arrives onto the scene, like this idea of the presence of God being all around us is actually, it's like in the Hebrew text as well. It's in the Hebrew scriptures before Jesus even shows up. Right? So if you look at, uh, th th there's this idea that the divine is here and among us and there's nowhere that God isn't. If you look at Psalms 139, Psalms 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Right? This is like rhetorical, nowhere. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Check out this one. Joshua, God is talking to Joshua. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Or what about this one? Jeremiah 23. God is speaking. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in the secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? What about this one? You back up to Genesis, the story of Jacob. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. The story of Jacob is this perfect illustration for us, where he literally woke up to the reality of the presence of God that he had been immersed in the entire time and had not been aware of it. He's like, oh, 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 okay, okay. God was already here. I, I just didn't see it before. And so, so much of the beauty of the incarnation, the birth of Christ, is that Jesus brings this tangibility to the ultimate reality that we find ourselves living in. This Jesus is the living representation of the presence of God that Jacob woke up to. Jesus is the God that is everywhere in front of us. So you have the Hebrew scripture pointing to this ultimate reality. Then you have God making God's self known through Jesus, helping people to see more clearly this reality. And then even after Jesus, you have several references, instances in the New Testament where it's pointing to this same idea, this everywhereness of God as well. Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 28. He's sending you know, the, the Great Commission. At the end of that, what does he say? In teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. Or what about this one? This is Paul. The God who made the word and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, but it does not live but does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. In him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Or what about this one? 1 Corinthians three sixteen. 
Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? What about this one? It's getting a bit repetitive. It's almost like we haven't figured it out. So you, how many times, if you have kids, do you have to repeat something for them to get it? Yeah? <laughs> we are the children. We are the world. We something. OK. You guys got me distracted. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, for things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones or powers, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You see, it's like this whole book, this Bible. This whole book is geared towards helping us all to move forward. Helping us to see the, the, that, that the, the thing that's already here, the bigger, more full reality that we are already a part of. This whole thing is pointing us towards this reality that the presence of God is here, now, among us, around us, within us. We cannot not be a part of it, and it cannot not be a part of us. We are like these waves in the ocean. Our lives are these individual waves but a wave cannot separate itself from the ocean from which it has taken shape. The wave only exists in the context of its connection to the ocean. The wave is just a particular expression of the greater wholeness. You see, and so when we wake up to this, this is, like, this is where the, the good stuff is. This is where we find belonging, like you, you already belong. This is where we find connection. This is where we find completeness. This is where we find identity. This is where we find purpose. This is where we find freedom. If we can wake up to this idea that we are not waiting on Christ to come, but rather Christ already pervades all things. What I believe it allows us to see is that although we may have fallen asleep in some of the tradition of Christmas, I think if you look closely, there's actually something quite beautiful that's found underneath the surface of everything else. And I think that is at the, at the very heart of Christmas. I think Christmas is actually this incredibly beautiful microcosm of God's intended reality. And for all the stress and the baggage that often comes with this time of year, I believe that underneath all of that, Christmas actually helps to resensitize us to a deeper and more connected reality. That there's, there's a lot about Christmas that moves us in the right direction. The problem is either we get distracted with a bunch of other junk, or we participate in it without realizing that we're actually doing it. It's really easy to get distracted at Christmas. I get really frustrated with like the commercialization of Christmas. It's really easy to get distracted with Christmas when you've got three kids. Right? Because at my house, we start talking about Christmas presents like way in advance. Way in advance. And my youngest son's birthday is, was yesterday, November 25th. Is that right? Yeah. No. Friday, whatever day it was. I don't know. It was close. We had a party. We've had like four parties. So I, I don't know which one was real, but he got presents and we ate and stuff. Anyways, his birthday is <laughs> near Thanksgiving. That's how I remember. He's super important to me. I love him deeply. So his birthday is, is near Thanksgiving. So that means like he starts looking at presents months before Thanksgiving, right? Because he starts looking for birthday stuff, but then the birthday list actually turns into a Christmas list. And then once my kids see my son is doing a Christmas list, then they have to start making it. So we've been making lists since like September, right? We've been making Christmas lists since September. And it's like driving me crazy. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to burn all this stuff. So, and, and then I don't know if you noticed, but like uh, Amazon got really smarter than it already is the past couple years where they started, they started going old school, pulling a page from like page from Sears and Roebuck's playbook, you know, like they're mailing catalogs to the house. You've seen this? Because they know if they can get the catalog into the house that the kids have a good chance of finding the catalog. And then my kids have been circling the Amazon toys for, since September. And then it get, gets even worse because they're talking about it in the house. And then Alexa is listening. And then all of a sudden, you start getting these ads that show up that, to tell you what they want. And like 
darn you, Alexa. Like, it's a, <laughs> it makes me very frustrated. And then on top of that, like, your kids are so tech savvy these days that, like, that there's good and bad to it because on one hand, my kids are, like, creating their own Amazon wish list on my Amazon account. So the good thing is, like, they're, they're, they're doing the shopping already, which is kind of nice. I just have to hit the button. But, the, like, the downside is, like, like, there's no surprise anymore. There's no, like, wonder. There's no, like, anticipation like, like I had when I was growing up. Is it socks? Is it a bike? You don't know. It just... Be grateful you got something, do you know? <laughs> this all gets me agitated. No mystery to anything. We don't have to wonder. We can look up anything and everything at any time. There's no anticipation or suspense, especially when it comes to Christmas, because they're doing their own shopping. So there's a lot of things that I get annoyed at with Christmas. The overscheduling, the overspending, the hyper-commercialization, all the garbage stuff that we buy that will eventually break in like a week or two. On top of that, like the actual garbage and waste that we generate this time of year, like it all drives me crazy. But there is a lot of good. There is a lot of good that we participate in, whether we believe it or not, whether we know it or not, whether we are consciously aware of it or not. It, and I believe it all speaks to God's intended reality. Think about the things that are starting to happen already and will continue to happen up through Christmas, like from Thanksgiving to Christmas. There is usually a heightened sense of generosity. There, there is usually this greater draw towards community. There is this acknowledgement in some way, shape, or form, whether people believe it or not, that there is this higher divine being, this God that has revealed God's self to humanity. Right? These, these, to me, are all very much a part of God's intended reality and serve to resensitize us to this much deeper and more profound existence that God has allowed us to experience. So Christmas, underneath all the commercialization, I think actually serves to highlight and to reveal and to remind us of the fullness of life that Christ came to invite us into. I think about the stuff, the good stuff that happens at Christmas, things that fall under the banner of like the Christmas spirit or whatever. You have Santa standing at the grocery store ringing a bell for the Salvation Army. So they're collecting money to do something good, hopefully for people in need. So you give them like a buck or some change and then you avoid them on the way out because they already got you and you're not gonna be scammed twice. I mean, you're not gonna be generous twice because isn't that too much generosity in one day? You gave them two quarters. What do they expect from you? There, there's all this great stuff happening. You have stuff like that. You have, you have, uh, you have like these massive tro toy drives for children, like Toys for Tots doing a good thing. You have people that are like taking time and, and effort to go serve Thanksgiving meals and Christmas meals to the homeless. Even within our church, you guys are on the, at the last minute stepped up and, and, and provided like 30 something meals for families in need in our community. Like that's incredible. We had 30 frozen turkeys. Have you ever tried to lift 30 frozen turkeys into a minivan? Yeah, I think I tweaked my back. Like, I literally felt the weight of your generosity. Like, and it was awesome. You know, we're, uh, so many of you are participating in our yearly angel tree where you're literally buying gifts for complete strangers because of your love of Jesus and wanting people to experience that love as well. Like, that's a beautiful thing. God is working through you to create a better world. Many of you like have participated or pretended to participate in our Better You, Better World 5K, right? Which is awesome. Like you, we were able to generate 3,500 bucks to give to Grace Mount Nutrition Center in Haiti where they're making sure that the mothers and babies in Haiti that don't normally get all the nutrition they need, that they get the nutrition and help that they need, that they can have healthy lives. So like if we could strip away all the excess, like commercialization, all the garbage stuff away from Christmas, the things that we have the tendency to get preoccupied with, Christmas is a beautiful picture of God's intended reality. It's like the snapshot of the kind of life we've been invited to step into. This kind of life where we wake up to the reality that Christ is already in our midst, that there's nowhere that God isn't. So Christmas at its heart, when we remove it from the other stuff, helps remind us that what we've been waiting for, what we've been looking for is actually already here. And when we live with this understanding that Christ is already here, the natural result should be 
that we would continue to live throughout the rest of the year the way that we typically reserve for Christmas. You know, the, the theme of the first week of Advent is actually, it's hope. Hope is great. I, I hope that you all have hope. But here's the thing about hope. Hope, by its very definition, is like this feeling of expectation, a feeling of desire for something to happen. I hope things get better. I hope the U.S. makes it out of group play in the World Cup. Yeah. I hope we get Christmas bonuses, whatever the thing is. We're waiting <laughs> for something to happen that hasn't and may or may not happen. We're waiting for these things. Hoping seems a bit like waiting, doesn't it? Hoping seems a bit like waiting, waiting, which brings us back to like our original discussion. If the things that we're waiting for or the thing that we're hoping for has already come, then we're not really waiting, are we? So, so if that which we're hoping for has already come, then our hope has been realized. The people of Israel were waiting. They maintained this hope that one day a savior would come and rescue their people. That hope has been realized which now means that for us, 2,000 years later, those of us, we, we know the rest of the story. We've been talking about it for years, for our whole lives. We know that hope has been realized. So maybe not only do we need a new perspective on waiting, that maybe we're not waiting on God, but rather God's waiting on us. Maybe we need a new perspective on hope as well. Because if the idea is that we're still waiting on the hope that we've already received, it seems a bit silly to still be hoping for it, doesn't it? So uh, was it last weekend, two weekends ago? Um, my middle son Ezra was playing, uh, he had a big baseball game, big baseball game. He was playing for the championships, the Little League championship at Oviedo Babe Ruth in his age bracket. Okay, big, big game, big game. Now, for me, I get really nervous in those situations. I get really like tense and anxious. One, because it's my kid, too, because like I have this secret hyper competitive side that I've worked really hard to repress and like try to move away from so that like I don't become a jerk because I've seen that side of me and I don't like it. So I've tried to work on myself. I appreciate your patience. So we get to the game and all that stuff starts to like well up a little bit. Like I could sense it and I'm getting angry and I find myself wishing bad on other like eight-year-olds on the field <laughs> and then I have to question who am I so um, we're playing the game and I get nervous and so I I, um, I start making like uh, passive aggressive comments towards the ump from the bleachers like nothing directly it's just very passive you know like because because I'm the preacher and if people find out I'm the preacher it's bad news for the church so like you have to you have to keep it down so anyways uh, this kid he like he's pretty good He's not, he's not the best on the team. He's not an all-star. I can objectively go, yeah, he's, like, he's solid, but like, there's three or four other kids that are like, I would pick first in a lineup. I'm just saying, don't tell him that. He's not here today, so it's fine. Don't tell him that. Um, but I would pick them first. But he's, you would still want him on your team. Like, he's solid. And here's the thing. This kid has played five seasons of Little League Baseball. And in five seasons, he has won not one, not two, not three, but four championships. Four seasons, four championships. This is his fifth season, and now he's in the championship game. Every season, I feel like I have to tell this kid, like, hey, buddy, you've been really blessed, but this is not how life works. You're not always on the winning team. At some point, he has to learn how to lose, right? That's a growing thing. That's how you mature. That's how you develop. Like, so I want to root against my kid, but I don't want to root against my kid. So it puts me in an awkward position when this is the fifth opportunity for a championship because like I know he needs to learn how to lose but also like going five for five is pretty awesome right so I'm a bit torn but anyways they play the game it's an intense game I'm making my comments trying to keep it to myself wrestling 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 we get to the end they make the final out and they win five for five yeah it's incredible it's incredible and so they win we're high-fiving we're jumping in the bleachers right like we're tout like we're um like saying things to the other team, but like not trying to say things to the other team, like in your face, but in love, but also like good game, but you know, all this stuff. So they, they, they win the game, everyone's on the field, they give the awards, they've got the medals, the championship medal, they have the pizza party, we have a great afternoon. Great afternoon, it's awesome. 
Now, imagine we get home that night and we're sitting at the dinner table and we're eating our dinner and Ezra's wearing his medal because he's super proud of it. And imagine he were to say something to me like, man, dad, you know what? I really hope we win the championship this year. <laughs> You'd be like, wait, what? what? Did I miss something? Like, wouldn't that seem a bit weird? Wouldn't that seem a bit odd? Like, buddy, what do, you, what do you mean? You hope you win the championship. Like, you're holding the proof. You're literally wearing the evidence that your team has won. Your hope has been realized. In fact, at this point, you have no hope because your hope has been fulfilled. <laughs> What you have now is assurance. You have freedom. You have security. You already have the thing. So now you get to move beyond hope and live with this confidence that you are already the champion. That's a great place to live. That's a great place to operate out of. If Christ has come, we have no hope. <laughs> That's a funny sentence to say in church. <laughs> Stay with me because it's the context that matters. We have no hope. We have that which is beyond hope. We have this assurance, this confidence, this security that we get to live out of. You've got the medal. You've won the championship. So with this in mind, maybe we need to reframe our understanding of hope as it relates to Christmas. If what we're hoping for has already been realized, then maybe hope isn't something we're waiting for. Maybe hope is something that we become. Maybe hope isn't what we're waiting for. Maybe hope is what we become. Here's what I mean. In the birth story of Jesus, in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, an angel appears to these fellows that are tending sheep in a field scares the heck out of him. It would me too. It's weird. Like, what the heck? But he gives him this message. The angel gives this message. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That hope has been realized. The Messiah the Savior has come. You've got the championship medal around your neck. So like you're not waiting. You're not hoping. And then what does the Messiah, what does the Savior grow up and do? What does hope realize look like? What does Jesus do with his life? He heals the sick. He restores sight to the blind. He spends time with the marginalized. He eats meals with the outcast. He develops community. He fights oppression. He feeds the hungry. He defeats sin and death. He brings these gifts to, into our world. He, he brings these offerings that are all pointing towards the creator, that are all inviting us into the fullness of life the things that are the framework of God's intended reality. And then he says, hey, you should do this too. Let's take this another step further. Let's take this idea of that maybe hope is not what we're waiting for, but rather hope is what we become. If Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, if he is the hope realized, the one that has come and walked among us and given us this blueprint for how to live, He's inviting us to be in relationship with God through him. He has invited us into the fullness of life by following and living and acting like him. What happens when we actually do this? And maybe even, like what happens when we die to the self and we become a follower of Christ? Well, Paul talks about this a lot. You can find this all throughout the Old Testament. Here's one instance where Paul mentions that he's talking about himself, but I believe it applies to us as well. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave, gave himself for me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So when I die to the self, it allows for this indwelling of the Christ. That is Christ living in you. 
which is to say that you are now the incarnation of hope realized. Do you see how big of a deal this actually might be? You are the incarnation of hope realized. So we said earlier, Advent is a season of waiting, but the thing we're waiting for has already come. So maybe it's not us who are waiting on God, but rather God who is waiting on us to wake up to the everywhereness of God, that we cannot be separate from the incarnational presence of the divine. And then we said that the focus of this week of Advent, the first week, is, is, is hope. But hoping is a bit like waiting. And the Savior, the Messiah, has come, and he's brought these gifts of healing and redeeming and the fullness of life. And when we die to the self and we take on the indwelling of Christ, the one who is the hope of the world realized, that now becomes a part of you. So it kind of makes me wonder if this Christmas we might do well to like adjust our lens a little bit. Of course, we want to be grateful for the reality of God gifting God's self to humanity in the form of a human to rescue and redeem all things. Yes, absolutely. But what if we adjusted our lens just a little bit? What if we thought about this thing a bit deeper? What if we thought about the manger a little bit different? What if we thought of the story of Christmas as a metaphor, not only for our lives, but for also how we should live them, for our calling. Like, what if we thought, are we the ones in the manger? That there is the Christ, the hope realize dwelling in us. And what does God want for us? What did God want for his son? What did the world need from his son? What does God want from us? Is for us to wake up and to grow into the ones who are now bringing the gifts. The gift of healing the broken. The gift of loving the hurting. The gift of a caring for the oppressed and the marginalized which ultimately is to say that hope is not something we're waiting for anymore. Hope is the thing that you now become. Hope is what has been fulfilled through Christ and is now living in you. So maybe this Christmas we need to wake up from this slumber of culture and tradition. Maybe we begin to live in a confidence with the understanding that we are saturated in the presence of Christ. There's nowhere that God isn't. And because of this, and because of our hope that has been realized, that is Christ now dwelling in you, you have been called to this incredible life in which you are to live in such a way that you are bringing hope to the world. Is it possible that the hope that sits at the heart of Christmas is now you. And God is waking, waiting for you to wake up and realize it. Amen. Um, one of the, the beautiful, mysterious things about the kingdom of God is it's what we describe as a, a now and a not yet. Uh, like Seth said, there's, uh, there's one sense in which our hope has been fulfilled, right? We have received the Son of God. Humanity has received the Son of God, and we've, we've been offered... Um, eternity. It's here. And then there's this other sense where it's, it's not yet. We're not fully in eternity with God. We're sort of here in this place and we get to sort of make this place more like that place. We get to offer this hope to the rest of the world. And it's a beautiful, 
beautiful thing. And so today, uh, on this first Sunday of Advent, we're gonna spend a few minutes uh, responding like we normally do. Um, communion servers uh, on each side of the room. If you're joining us online, you can take communion with whatever elements you have available, uh, wherever you are. Uh, we have prayer partners online. We also have people in the room uh, who would absolutely love to pray with you uh, on both sides. We have our prayer wall in the room if you wanna just write a prayer and, and symbolically give that up to God. But most of all, we just invite you in these next few minutes to, uh, to meditate and to pray and to commune with God, to ask God maybe to, to reveal the hope um, in your life, in your situation, in your specific circumstance that he's calling you to wake up to and to see. Maybe for God to reveal to you the way that you can be that hope the people in your life, at your job or in your family or in your neighborhood. And also this morning, we're gonna do this each week during Advent. We're gonna join with Christians all over the world who are celebrating Advent today and lighting a candle uh, to represent the hope the light of Christ brings to the world. We're gonna do this each week. We're gonna, we're gonna join in with this great tradition of the church globally, all through time and space. Um, and so now I'm gonna pray and then we'll, we'll uh, let you have some time to respond. God, we, we love you. And uh, we are so grateful for the hope that comes in Jesus the hope that comes through the presence of Christ on earth, Emmanuel, God with us. And God, we're so, so grateful that through Jesus, we get the opportunity to step into your kingdom here and now, even as we know that there's more to come. There are greater things ahead. There's a not yet that will be fulfilled. And God, we pray that as we go through this season of Advent, that you would, uh, as Seth talked about, help us to, to begin to disassociate the commoditization of Christmas from the way that we celebrate the coming of the Savior. God, help us to find ways to be hope to the world around us to take the hope that we've received, that we've had fulfilled in our faith, and to translate it into action in the world around us. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his death and his resurrection. Right now, as we eat this bread and drink this juice, we do it in remembrance of what Jesus did for us, and we do it in the hope that we will step more fully into eternity. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.